That's a big challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Because first, first and foremost, these thoughts are aimed at the, the Chinese audience, you know, all the, the members of the CPC so that people can understand, people can refer to it rather easily without having to repeat all the, all the keywords and so on. Mm. So there is a fine balance, right, yeah. to strike between yes. how you do it on a domestic uh, narrative and, and on an international mm -hmm. But scale. again, it's, a, it's a, an important point and a good point. Much of the material is written by Chinese people in Chinese for Chinese people. Yes. And China's discourse is very, very different from an international and particularly a Western discourse. So trying to convert that material into something that actually engages with an international audience is a very, very difficult thing to do. Is there one example, if I press you here, to think about something that you worked on that uh, you think you managed at least to translate you know, something that's quite hard to get across, but you managed. Well, um, one of the ones that we changed was the three stricts and the three earnests. <laughs> okay. Which doesn't work already in English because yeah. strict and earnest are yeah, adjectives. adjectives. But we managed to persuade them to turn it into six rules for conduct, I which see. is what they are. Okay. So instead of saying three stricts and three earnests, which means nothing in English and tells you nothing about what it is. You say six, <laughs> yeah, six rules of conduct. It tells you, okay, now I know what they are, mm. the rules of conduct, mm. the things that people have to do. Bravo, <laughs> bravo. It's, it's, there are a lot of these. But uh, anyway, that's, that's the tradition. And, uh, but the, the, the challenge is, you know, you come from your background and uh, you, I, I suppose you have these kind of conversations with your friends or with your family back home um, in other parts of the world. How do they react to what you do here? Do they understand it? Well, the truth of the matter is they give me a pretty tough time. Hmm. They all live in the West. They're constantly exposed to Western media. They're constantly exposed to Western discourse. I mean, all of my kids, all of my older kids have actually been to China. Mm. So they have been here. But uh, I mean, I'm their dad, so they don't give me an easy time anyway. But those of my family that I discuss the matter with, they give me a pretty tough time. They've, they've taken in They've taken in the discourse that, they, that they're hearing from the Western media, and they give me—they don't give me an easy time. They want to know why I'm serving the the CPC, why I'm part of the party machine. One of the things that I'm regularly told, for example, is that although I've been in China for 15 years, I'm only allowed to see what they want me to see. Okay. So they don't give me an easy time of it. I don't have any, e and certainly it's not. It's certainly not a situation. Where there are I stand. two China. One is what you are allowed to see. One is well, that, <laughs> yes, that, that's what they think. But mm. they certainly don't allow me to stand up on a podium and explain to them and lecture them and tell them about Xi Jinping mm. thought and socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. But why do you insist on doing this in the first place? I mean, okay, I want to I want to go to mm -hmm. you know exactly why there is so much misrepresentation about China, but just out of interest because this is very different from what you were educated in. You know, you travel around the world. Why do you think this is so fundamentally important to do? Well, my wife is Chinese, and uh, when my wife comes to Scotland, she doesn't spend all her time lecturing me about all Scotland's shortcomings. She doesn't mm -hmm. constantly point out to me all the things that are wrong, which would be very easy to do. And my feeling is that when I'm in her country, as a guest in her country, and I've invited myself here, nobody forced me to come, mm. I owe her the same courtesy to look about what's good in China and to talk about what's good in China. And if you do that, there are plenty of things to see. Anybody who wants to read what's wrong with China, or to listen to what's wrong with China, has hundreds or thousands of Western journalists to listen to or to, to read right. from. And they will find out everything that's wrong with China. I think that it's incumbent on at least one or two of us to try to tell the other side of the story. And that is why I do it. But in, uh, indeed, there are a lot of misrepresentations about China, especially, for instance, when we talk about COP26, you know, yeah. the, the climate discussion, yeah. a lot of criticism. Uh, why does China not promise more? Mm -hmm. Why, you know, Chinese president is not mm -hmm. there, that he, yeah. you know, um, he, he's, uh, he's uh, snubbing it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What do you think is really behind all of these sentiment? Well, 
That's a good point, and it actually takes me back to the discussion we were having a few minutes ago about the axioms. The scientific outlook on development was formed in the early 2000s, and it was a massive transformation in China's whole economic strategy. It was a shift from economic growth, which is purely focused on economic needs, to an economic growth which will take into account economic needs, social needs, and environmental needs and give equal balance to all of them. Mm -hmm. And it was called the scientific outlook on right. development. Under and President these five yeah, yeah. And, uh, and these five words tell you nothing about what it is. The axiom that was formulated, to, you could look at these words forever and not understand what it means. A massive, massive But is shift. it true? It is it only a problem of China not communicating itself well Well, it was enough? a missed opportunity, really. Because 20 years ago, China's, China's strategy shifted fundamentally. And they had an opportunity to send a message to the world mm. and to tell the world. And they failed to take, they failed to recognize the opportunity and they didn't take advantage of it. And 20 years later, you've just told me yourself, anything to do with the environment, anything to do with China, all you'll ever hear about is how China does nothing for the environment. China's dirty. China's a polluter. China be, doesn't care. Yeah, you seem to be suggesting that it's it's solely on the on the part of China that we didn't communicate ourselves effectively enough. That there is this you know big misrepresentation about China. Is there a certain part of responsibility on the other side? Oh, very clearly, much more of the responsibility is on the other side. I simply wanted to take advantage of highlighting one specific mm. end instance where this focus on axiom leads to problems. So you, and again, it bears out what you were saying. Why don't we make a message first that people can understand outside of China? But uh, by far, by far, the bigger side of the problem comes from the West. So you think China can actually tell its story much better than what we're doing I now? think China can do a much better job of telling their stories because too much of the story is a formal discourse. Um, too much emphasis is put on the formal discourse and too much of it is Chinese people writing in Chinese for Chinese people. So there's no doubt at all that China can do a much better job. But the fundamental problem is not China's problem. China is trying to open to the world and certain forces in the world do not like that. They don't like what's happening. So what exactly is an informal narrative, if I, you know, to well, know? Xi Jinping talks all the time about the need to tell China's stories yes. and how important it is. And one of the things that China, ironically, is really, really good at is soft power. Is it? Because They're a really, lot of people think the opposite. They're like, America is the soft power. Well, there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about the fact that America dominates the soft power agenda. Mm. But China is actually really good at making blockbuster films. China is really good at making blockbuster films. Have you seen Lake Changjin? It's <laughs> yeah. a really good film. Chosen, Chosen Reservoir film. Yeah. But people have you would, seen Have you seen, Red, seen, have you seen Red Cliff? I've seen it's it. It's a brilliant film. I've Did seen it. Did you see the film that was reduced in my country? I think it was called that was um, that was uh, that came out for the 70th anniversary of the PRC back in 2019. I think it was called My Country in English. I, think, I don't know what the oh, title. Oh, um, maybe not that one. You know that you, you, you know yeah. the film. It was a set of stories I've about seen, important you know, events in the history of the PRC. About I, seven I've stories. I've seen that one. I've yeah. seen that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, I saw that one. But that's but a really good film. See, see, this is interesting. You think these are good blockbusters. Yes. But if you if you ask some people, especially out there, they don't know about it, or they think it is, you know, Chinese, <laughs> whatever it is, you know. Yeah. Well. It just needs to be done a bit more cleverly. But the reason why soft power is important is because soft power speaks directly to an audience. China's formal discourse takes place at a formal level. And the messages that they send out are filtered. They're filtered by the media and the politicians in the country they're talking to. They're filtered by the very people who are the cause of the problem. Soft power speaks directly to an audience. It mm. goes straight to the people that you're trying to convince. We are not the evil dragon. We're just ordinary, decent people, and we want to get on with our lives, and we want to get on with the world. You can tell that message. When I, the, the examples that I've given aren't necessarily perfect examples. My country was a heavily 
was heavy on propaganda and so is Lake Changjin. But if you make a film to talk to people, telling a slightly different work. story, yeah. it would it work. work. It, it would work. work because China's really good at it. And China has a lot of muscle now and a lot of clout. China wants to get a film into American cinemas. They can do it. Let's see, let's see. But uh, finally, personally, I mean, you have won two uh, prestigious awards for China that foreign experts, that's what we call foreign experts here in China, can get. What's next to you? What's well, next for you? Well, specifically, I have two things to do. You know that I've written several books on contemporary China, and I love that because uh, I always have a great time writing them. I have to write a book on Gansu, on Gansu province. In northwest on China. The, yeah, on the poverty alleviation uh, effort mm -hmm. and building a beautiful countryside, which is the step after poverty alleviation. Yeah. A lot of people talk about how, yeah, they're going to just forget about it now. There is an, another step. So I'll be writing a book about Gansu. Um, I have to write a book about Guangdong. I wrote a book Southern about China. Guangdong. Yeah, I go, okay. wrote a book about Guangdong about 10 years ago okay. uh, about the economic and political, the new strategy. And I have to write a book um, updating that strategy. But the one other thing which I do want to do is I want to write a film script about mm. a story which to make I a picked up. To make a, <laughs> I, I found a fantastic story. Great. The reason why it's great okay. is because it's true. Okay. It's about Americans and Chinese working together in great adversity mm. and achieving a huge success. I so, smell great potential in there. <laughs> I smell great potential. I look well, forward I hope to that. Somebody, yeah. I hope there's somebody out there listening to me say that's a great yeah, idea. Okay, I, I hope want so. to be part of that. Finally, you have a book over there we haven't talked about it. You want to tell me very yeah. briefly about this book. Yeah. yeah maybe just show, hold it, hold it up to the camera as well. So this is, let me see, Xi Jinping. It's called Xi Jinping, Zhejiang, China, A New Vision for Development. Okay. Now, this is a really interesting book because it's actually a compilation of articles that Xi Jinping wrote when he was the party secretary in Zhejiang. Mm. Uh, he used to write one or two articles every week for the local newspaper. newspaper. Mm -hmm. so it's and his articles are very short. Yeah. They're only one or but two pages long. But sparkles of his thoughts in early yeah. stages. I mean, he is a really good writer. He writes really well from a Western perspective because okay. he says what he has to say in clear words and he only says it once. <laughs> and what, when people ask me about reading the governance of China, about Xi Jinping, though, about how to come to grips with it, I always refer to them to this right. book. Read I say, this. read this book first. Okay. It's shorter and simpler and much easier to understand. And you can see Xi Jinping thought try, starting to take shape through that book. Thank you so much, David Ferguson, the main English language editor of Xi Jinping, The Governance of China. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. With that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Lixin in Beijing. Download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.